Okay, we are going to get started. Welcome, everybody, and thank you, everyone, who has joined us today for the first session in what is going to be a 10-part series called Become a Cybersecurity Ninja. Today's session is Digital Security Strategy, or Risk Assessment and Threat Modeling. Uh, these sessions are going to occur every two weeks for the next 10 weeks. We're going to end on, I believe it's May 30th is the last date. Uh, next week is going to be, or the, in two weeks, our next session will be basic network security. And our guest will be Ken Montenegro of Asian Americans Advancing Justice. And if you want to view information on the entire series, you can, of course, visit at uh, ninja.rtt.nyc. And we'll, we'll be updating that site with additional information, resources, um, everything we have through the course of this series. So Here's our ninja plan, so to speak, and this is very much subject to change, just so everybody knows. Uh, today, we're, of course, threat modeling, threat modeling, and risk assessment. Uh, in two weeks, we're going to do network security basics. Our plan after that is to cover authentication on February 21st. We're going to be talking about passwords, password managers, two-factor authentication, other ways to authenticate to systems. On March 7th, we're going to be talking about encryption, uh, document email device encryption. On March 21st, we're going to be talking about phishing, social engineering, and ransomware. It's called Gone Phishing. On April 4th, we're going to be dealing with mobile security, so smartphones, laptops, uh, working on the move, joining wireless networks, that kind of thing. On April 18th, we're going to be dealing with digital privacy. We're going to be talking about virtual private networks, the Onion Router or Tor, uh, reining in your kind of social exposure, the amount of information that's available publicly. On May 2nd, we're going to be reviewing security tools and services. So we're going to cover probably 30 or 40 different security tools and services. So it'll be a very quick overview of just some of a bunch of tools that some of us and our colleagues have, have assembled that work well for them. On May 16th, now what? We're going to be covering incident response. And then the last session is going to be a general question wrap-up. Uh, we might, again, this is all subject to change, so if there's a lot of questions along the way or if there's other topics that emerge, we're, we might reserve that session for that. And then, of course, there's a Ninja certification quiz. At the end of this, we're going to offer a quiz. It's not going to be a, a cakewalk by any stretch, but if you've attended uh, all or most of the sessions, it should be something you're able to complete. And for those of you who are able to uh, get the quiz, we're going to not only um, send you a, an official uh, ninja <laughs> cybersecurity ninja certificate, but you'll also be eligible to win a whole variety of prizes that we're offering. They're all kind of security related things, all right? So hopefully that will help everybody. We've got a bunch of folks here now, and I'm just gonna make sure I can see the questions in case things are coming in. Um, I have somebody saying they can't hear anything. Um, and someone's saying they're having trouble going to ninja.rtmyc. Well, I will correct both of these things at the end of the webinar. Uh, it sounds like the, uh, the audio is fine now. Okay, thank you so very much. And I'm going to continue on. Excellent, excellent. All right, so I, of course, am Joshua Peske, Vice President of Technology Strategy. I will be with you here for all 10 sessions. And today is hopefully the only session I will be doing by myself. I have guests lined up for over half of the remaining sessions and I'm working to get uh, different security experts for each one of those. So we'll have a variety of voices and uh, we've got Ken Montenegro next week. I've got some other folks lined up as well and uh, we'll be presenting a variety of voices for you. Roundtable Technology, we are a team of dedicated technology professionals. We operate out of Maine and New York, primarily in New York City, and we help hundreds of organizations achieve their missions through effective use of technology. And we're hoping that this series is something that everybody Finds helpful. So we're going to start things off. So today we're covering digital security strategy, risk assessment, and threat modeling. We're going to dive right into what we mean by that. All right. And our learning objectives are to learn how to perform a basic risk assessment. So uh, first of all, decide what that means, because there's a variety of different things that a risk assessment could mean. We're going to review different approaches to risk assessment. We're going to understand different types of risk that your organizations may face and how they might impact you in different ways. We're going to introduce a whole bunch of resources to help you undertake a risk assessment, and we want to learn about your biggest concerns. And we're gonna ask in a, in a few different ways, what are the things that are kind of keeping you awake at night or worrying your staff or worrying your folks? And we're gonna start off with a quick poll here. We just wanna get a sense of, has your organization ever 
uh, performed a technology-related risk assessment. So if people can go ahead and just uh, give some answers to that. And I'm just curious, we're gonna be kind of collecting some data along the way. And we're curious to know of the attendees of this, sort of what their um, history around security and risk assessment and different things are. So we're gonna ask these questions along the way. We'll leave this poll just open for a, a few more seconds and see what uh, additional responses we get here. And let's take a look at what folks are, are seeing here. So let's share the results here. So just under half of the audience has never performed a technology-related risk assessment. 4% uh, want to know who's asking. 31% uh, have done it once or twice, but with little or no, little or no follow-up action. So that gets us well over or over 75%, three quarters of the people here have either never done it or have done it once or twice, but never done anything with it. And under 10%, 8% of us have uh, performed an annual risk assessment. And good for you guys, those of you who, who are doing that. So thank you very much. All right, let's go back to our deck here. And thank you all for your answers. So let's cover risk assessment. I'm gonna, and I apologize in advance, I'm about to show you two different slides, one with uh, seven steps for risk assessment and one with five, and I'll explain why I'm gonna do that because there's a lot of different perspectives here. And while I certainly didn't want to show you you know, all of the ones that I've encountered over the years and uh, as I do risk assessments for organizations. And by the way, I should at this point probably give you a little background on myself and my history doing cybersecurity and risk analysis. So for the last probably three years, I've been engaged by a variety of organizations to perform risk analysis or cybersecurity work or uh, threat modeling or different things for their organizations. And it's increasingly becoming something that uh, is the primary sort of work that I'm doing uh, because a lot of more organizations are asking for this. And while I am not, you know, an entrenched, you know, cybersecurity expert in the sense of having, um, you know, working in cybersecurity organizations for a long time, um, this is work I've been doing for, for quite a while with a variety of organizations. And I would say I approach it at the kind of high level, common sense level as much as uh, as I can explain that. And that's that's where we're gonna start here. So when organizations ask me, you know, is our security okay? And that's kind of where they start a lot of the time. I generally say, well, you know, to answer that, I have to understand what sort of risks you're worried about because I, I don't know whether your security is okay until I understand more about your organization and what would be the consequences of different kinds of bad things that might happen to you. All right, and so there's these sequence of questions, and this is a framework from, from NIST, from a NIST publication around risk assessment or risk analysis, and there's, there's a bunch of different names for it, but essentially, first, what information do you have in your organization, right? That's, that's a good starting point. A lot of organizations actually have a little bit of a difficult time answering that, especially larger ones. Um, how much do you care about that information? And I'm gonna give you some very specific ways to think about how much you care about it as we come up, what could happen to the information? So what are the bad things that could happen to it? And it's really important to understand that we're not just talking about hacking or just talking about information breaches, which is where everybody leaps to, but something like a hard drive failing is a bad thing that could happen that could cause you to lose information or not have access to information, which is actually a security problem in, in many instances. So it's important to understand not just kind of hackers or, or you know, deliberate malicious attempts against your organization are things that you're thinking about, but you're also thinking about things like, well, what if um, the power goes out? Or what if a hard drive fails? Or what if our staff accidentally delete a bunch of information? Those are equally things that, that you need to consider here. How likely are these things to happen? How bad would it be if it happened? We'll, we'll help you think about that. How will you know? This is one of the hardest things <laughs> especially around breaches, is how do you know if your information has been breached, if someone has accessed your information and taken it? Sometimes it's really obvious. You can't find any of your files because they've been uh, lost, or you can't access all of your files because uh, ransomware has encrypted all of the files, right? And sometimes you may not know, or there may be some signs, but you're not really sure. And then lastly, and this is a really important one, is how are you going to respond, okay? So here's the second one, I did warn you about this, and this is threat modeling, okay? And this is a different word for 
risk assessment. Okay, they're, they're kind of two different names for similar kinds of activities. And this is from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. So the my kind of summary of the NIST risk assessment framework was with seven basic questions or seven things to think about. EFF breaks it into just five, all right, which is what do you want to protect? Who do you want to protect it from? How likely is it that you will need to protect that information? How bad are the consequences if you feel? And here is, I think, my favorite question that the EFF asks, and this is not one that's in that, that NIST framework that I, I put up before. Because this is kind of a fundamental question, right? How much trouble are you willing to go through? How much effort are you willing to expend, all right, to prevent those consequences? That's really the fundamental question. Because again, we had, I think it was 30 some odd percent of people who'd performed a risk assessment, but not really taken any action, right? So the, the risk assessment showed them that there was some gaps or some risks that they had, but they didn't act on it because there wasn't, they, they decided they weren't willing to go through that much trouble yet. And by the way, this often can change quite, sometimes quite radically, immediately following something bad really happening, right? So, so you might have not a lot of willingness to make security changes or, or put forth a lot of effort uh, at your organization. And then the day after something really bad happens, all of a sudden, there's a massive amount of effort. And neither of those are really good things, right? No effort uh, before you have a breach is, is not good. And massive amounts of effort that are probably not necessarily appropriate uh, are, are also not great. And when you put all of these things together, you arrive at, and this is, I'm more just sharing this with you because it's a term that you'll hear. And I think that's useful uh, it, it, when you start talking about security at your organization is the idea of your security posture for your organization. And I think this is relatively common sense for most of us, which is that if I'm a theater group operating in New York City and I do uh, children's theater and, you know, a few times a year we, we put on some plays and some families buy tickets to our plays and the only information we have are people's names and phone numbers and email addresses and their credit cards go into something and we have a website where we just promote the, the acts we're doing. You know, our security profile from a cybersecurity sense is is not very high, right? We're, we're not uh, targets in, in, a, in a meaningful sense for a lot of different kinds of bad people. We don't have any personal health information, so we don't have to deal with HIPAA compliance. We are collecting credit cards, but in a very simple kind of basic way that, that's relatively easy to, to, to safeguard. And we don't have information on anybody other than emails and phone numbers. Maybe we have addresses and that would be maybe bad if it got breached. But overall, we have a pretty pretty mellow security profile, right? Uh, on the other hand, if I'm an international human rights organization and I have staff in Iran and Syria and China and you know other other govern other countries where their governments may be actively looking to you know access our communications, possibly arrest our people as they go across borders, possibly, uh, you know, scan, take their mobile devices and look for any information on them. And if they find information on them, our staff could wind up in jail and our clients could wind up in jail. Well, that's a very, very different kind of security posture. And so you, and, and organizations, by the way, that are like that tend to be very aware of this, but not always. Okay, so you kind of put these things together and you arrive at this idea of security posture. And I think that's a useful way to think of security posture. And here's the biggest thing that I find about security posture is that people are really inconsistent about it. Um, and that consistency, I think, is a hugely important thing to try to make, make consistent. Sorry, that was a very awkward sentence. Make consistent for your organization. Because uh, I see, I, I was dealing with an organization just a couple of months ago and they wouldn't let me I needed to download an application for a project we were doing, and I couldn't even get to their website to download the application because they would only allow whitelisted network addresses onto it. So they had me go to a proxy server that um, that they would provide me uh, so that I could download it to that proxy server and then use that proxy server to upload it to some other place where I could grab it. 
And of course, I needed to log into the proxy server. So then they just emailed me the uh, IP address of the proxy server, a username and a password, all to log into that proxy server just in plain text email. And I was kind of confused. I'm like, which, what's your security posture? Is it extremely secure where you, I only whitelisted IPs can get to this server? Or is it not secure at all where you're emailing uh, credentials around in plain text, which I consider to be, just in case anyone's curious, a very bad practice. Okay, let's talk about categories of risk. So I, I talked a little bit earlier about how I was going to give you uh, a little bit of a framework to think about um, how bad would it be if, if, if something happened, right? So what information do you have and how bad would it be if something happened to it, right? How much do you care about that information? So I would su submit to you that there's three ways, well, I wouldn't submit to you. This is kind of a standard in the industry. NIST, NIST and other entities, SANS, use, use this framework. Uh, the CIA, which of course is a lovely acronym, it's easy to remember. Uh, so confidentiality, which you think about is how bad would it be if the information was exposed to someone who wasn't supposed to see it, okay? And that's the one we all jump to when we are uh, thinking about security and cybersecurity. We all jump to the someone breaks in, you know, using some sort of um, hacking tools or using social engineering or one of my staff emails it out or some, somehow someone gets access to the information that we have and now does something with it, right? They have our confidential information and they can go do something with it. Um, but that's only one third, right, of the things that we're actually concerned about. All right, integrity is how bad would it be if the information was lost and I couldn't recover it? All right, that's, that's something that is probably pretty bad for lots of types of information that you have and might in fact be a lot worse than the exposure. And in fact, most organizations that I work with would probably much, if they had to choose, would much prefer that all the information was exposed rather than all of it being lost if they had to pick, pick one or the other. And then the, the third one is how bad would it be if the information was not available for some period of time. And this is something that, that people get kind of freaked out about with let's say email, right? So uh, most of us are on cloud platforms now like Gmail or Office 365. We don't experience a lot of email outages, but I think most of us can probably remember five, 10 years ago when email servers were more common and, and not having email for you know a day because there's a problem with the email server was like a catastrophe, right? Everybody kind of couldn't function. Uh, and the reality is now we'd probably be grateful if email stopped working because we could actually get some work done, but uh, that's, a, that's a separate issue. Anyway, Anyway, so these are three different things, confidentiality, integrity, availability, okay? And then we think about the impact. So if um, the, the integrity of the information was compromised, meaning we lost information and we couldn't recover it, how bad is that? Okay, so you can think about the impact or how bad, right, in terms of how much time would it cost you to recreate the information, to recover the information, to you know, get back to an operating state. Um, how much money would it cost you uh, to, to do that? And how much money, there's a variety of ways to think about money. You could think of lost productivity for your staff as something that costs you money. You could think of the time that it takes your IT department or a consultant to you know, recover that information. Uh, and if you're paying that consultant, then how much time that costs. If you have to pay some sort of uh, data forensic forensics uh, person or, or organization to pull data off drives or, or pull them off something that next cost. And then there's reputational damage. It's much harder to quantify in, in like a dollar sense, but it is an important thing to think about, which is if you're, you know, if you lose all the information for all of your clients and have to tell your clients, sorry, we lost your email address and your, you know, that, that kind of hurts. And if you lose all of your donor's credit cards and have to tell your clients, sorry, your credit cards were exposed, right? This famously happens to Target. Uh, that's, that's pretty bad, right? That's a pretty bad reputational risk and, and could cost you quite a bit of money. All right. So we're going to throw up another poll now. I'm curious now that we've, we've walked through those, which category of impact most concerns the folks here in the audience today. So which category of impact most concerns the, uh, the folks here today? And I'm just uh, interested to see. I'm only letting you pick one, I understand. Um, and it's interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm going to show the results here in a minute as we get other responses. And by the way, feel free to keep putting in questions. Remember, I've got plenty of time at the end for, for q and I'm playing stick around for a little bit. All right, let's go ahead and show the results. We got just a couple more in here. All right, let's take a look. 
So over half of you, that confidentiality number is high. So there's obviously, and this might be a self-selecting group of people who choose to come to a cybersecurity ninja training, right, uh, where you have information that you're worried about being exposed. Uh, but, uh, of, you know, about a fifth, a little over a fifth of you, integrity is, is the thing you're most concerned about. And another fifth of you, actually, availability is the thing you're most concerned about. So thank you all for, for jumping in on these uh, polls. We have, we have only one more to go. And let's go ahead and jump ahead. So I'm going to show you a couple of templates that we have. All of these are available to you as resources at the end of the webinar, so at the, the last page. And by the way, uh, everyone will get an email tomorrow with a link to the, the slide deck and a link to this recording. So don't you'll you'll get and, and that'll be true for every single one of the sessions that we do. You will always get the slide deck and the recording a day afterward. And any resources that you see in the slide deck, you will uh, all of those are hyperlinked. So you don't have to worry about trying to quickly grab any of those while we're while we're here on the session today. So this is a Google Doc, a lot of the or a Google Sheet actually that I'll share with you. And this is something I actually use in my risk analysis project that I do with organizations where we we put together all the different sources of information that they may have, and we actually actually ask them to classify it on confidentiality, integrity, and availability. I generally encourage people to reserve, by the way, if you do wind up using these tools yourself, to reserve the classification of high for threats that are potentially kind of organization ending, you know, that are, uh, go back to that, that earlier slide that I, that I have. Um, so I, I kind of have the joke there, but, uh, let's see, existential, right? An existential threat. So, uh, in this, in this sense, I, I kind of mean this almost, um, literally, uh, if it's an existential threat to your organization, then it's something that I would consider to be, uh, a high threat, right? So if it's something that, if this happened, you might not be an organization anymore. Oh, sorry, I skipped ahead then uh, save that for high or, or very, very bad. And then everything else is going to be moderate or low. And the reason for that is if you have a ton of stuff that's high, then going back to this idea of how much effort are you willing to expend to uh, resolve this, you, you might wind up with too much work to do. And I really want people to find things on which they feel that they can take action, right? And so you want to limit that kind of scope to things you can actually do. Some things to keep in mind, all right, as you go through this. Okay, number one, threats against confidentiality, all right, can be the most challenging to address. And, and one of the reasons for that is uh, you have to safeguard essentially every possible arena, and any weak spot in your organization is a potential uh, path through which a breach can happen. And that is most often a person but it could be a firewall that isn't patched up. It could be a server that isn't patched up. It could be a single computer that has a, an older version of Adobe running on it. Um, and of course, there's all kinds of zero day threats that can happen. There's uh, an employee can accidentally expose information through email. There's so many different ways that information can be exposed that trying to keep information really sealed tight is very hard. And if you have any doubts about that, you know, reading the news, I think, pretty much should put those doubts aside, right? There's really hardly an organization that we could think of, the NSA included, that has been able to effectively keep their information under wraps. Uh, and, you know, you can go down the list, you can go with, you know, Sony, you can go with Chase, you can go with Target, you can go with Home Depot, you can go with uh, Yahoo over and over and over again, right? It, it's, uh, it's tough. And these very big organizations really struggle with it. So it's going to be harder for you. Now, one of the ways to do it is to reduce scope, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, threats against availability uh, can be the ones that most impact productivity. So again, if, if someone can't get access to key information or a key application, uh, that keeps them from being productive, and that is a cost to your organization. All right, you probably have information in lots of different places. And what do I mean by that? You probably have 
most of you probably have a file server still. You also probably have information in Dropbox, that some, whether you know it or not, your staff are keeping some information in Dropbox. Probably also have information in Google Drive. You probably have a CRM application like Salesforce or something like that. You have information on your website. You have information in your email marketing tool. You have information and tons of it in your email system, whether it's Gmail or Office 365. You probably have an accounting system. There's information there. You also, you know, on and on and on. So there's information in a lot of different places. So starting to get your head around all the different places where you have that information and where there's sensitive information that you care about in those places is a, is a really important starting point. You can't eliminate risk, uh, going back to that earlier point of all the different breaches that are there, that should be clear. All right, the goal, all right, is again, thinking about the security posture idea is to find the right balance for your organization. And over the course of this whole 10 part series, that's something that I, I wanna remind people of again and again and again. We're gonna be showing you so many different things you can do. Doesn't mean you need to do all of them. It's up to you and your organization to figure out what's appropriate for us. Here's another uh, template that we'll, that we'll share with you. This is a risk assessment report template. This is again based on, I believe I pulled this from NIST, although I, I can't remember. Uh, this is based on like an 80 page report, but this is just a little risk and mitigation matrix. And what, what we're showing is that we've got a file server, just looking at the top row here. So we'll say, okay, we've identified a vulnerability on the file server. All right, this risk type, what does it impact? It impacts all three areas, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. We have a brief description, which is that the server is over 10 years old and running Windows 2003, which went end of life in July 2015. Still a lot of those out there, believe it or not. We're calling that risk level high. We're saying this you know, could die, could be breached, could get malware on it, and this could potentially really damage the organization to the point of the organization not existing. So we have some recommended mitigations, which is to look at moving it to a cloud-based you know, document management system like Google Drive, Dropbox, et cetera. And then you go down and uh, Salesforce, which we, we don't believe impacts um, availability because Salesforce, the availability is managed by them. But uh, the passwords don't have enforced complexity requirements uh, or expiration. We view that as a risk, so we suggest increasing the complexity. Uh, this was actually done a while ago. Right now, I would certainly uh, have the recommendation to implement two-factor authentication, which Salesforce has supported now for some time. Again, this is a, a template that you'll get. You'll have access to all of these. Another thing you look at as part of a risk assessment when you're trying to figure out is, is what are your existing safeguards? So what safeguards do we currently have in place? And the main reason that I want to show you this table is to make the point that backups uh, don't really safeguard against confidentiality or against availability. Backups protect against integrity if they're done well, right? So if it's a, it's a good like cloud-based backup, uh, or something that's using different credentials than uh, the the server, the basic server credentials. If you're backing up servers, because ransomware otherwise will will encrypt your backups as well. And uh, it only safeguards against integrity. And it 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 can even be argued that backups worsen confidentiality because they in effect create a copy of your data that is now in a different location with a different set of protections around it. So it's it's expanding the scope of that information that you're trying to protect, right? So integrity and confidentiality in some ways can work against each other as you try to safeguard both of those. But you'll see that a lot of these other things that you do, having robust policies if people are you know adhering to them, having a response plan, uh, managing your access controls well, having IT controls such as antivirus and firewalls, Providing security awareness training to your staff, which is something we're absolutely going to be talking about in future sessions. Performing a risk assessment, like what we're talking today. These can help across all the different areas. Uh, as we kind of get to the end here, uh, some of you, if you're, if you're having to kind of talk to executives about risk assessment and they're not very excited to work on it, uh, I just want to point out that a $5,000 bad thing that does not happen because you identified that this was a risk and mitigated it or safeguarded against it is just as valuable dollar for dollar as a 5,000 good thing that does happen, right? So it's, if, if you avoid uh, some disaster or some very expensive problem that would have cost your organization $5,000 that you hadn't planned on spending, that is just as good 
as if someone wrote a check to your organization for $5,000. And if you take into account the cognitive bias of loss aversion, which is a different webinar, then it's actually worth uh, quite a bit more, almost twice as much. But uh, unless, for those of you who are not <laughs> cognitive bias nerds, uh, that, that joke is just lost in you, but it's, uh, it's true. All right, that takes us to our last poll. And this is the one I'm, I'm kind of really curious to see what the responses are. All right, so what are the biggest obstacles to addressing risks at your organization? So you can choose as many of these as you want. This is the first one where I'm letting you make multiple choices. You can enter other ones into the questions field if you want. And uh, one, of the, one of the questions that came in or a comment uh, around the, uh, the EFF in terms of how much trouble you're willing to go through is how much money you're willing to spend, right? And and I'm interested to know how much money really is an obstacle to people, and I guess we'll, we'll obviously find out here. Uh, and again, that ROI hopefully helps you understand if to the degree that you can start to monetarily quantify on some level the the risks that you have, that's where I think it, it can start to make sense to invest into these other things. All right, so let's take a look at the, the results here. 60% of you said skills, so great, okay? So this webinar series, hopefully, will start to give you some of those skills that you need. Hopefully, today feels like a good start for folks. All right, money, I can't help as much with. I can say there are some pro bono resources out there that can help with this stuff, and uh, Taproot Plus is one. Catchifier is another. You can use your LinkedIn network, um, and, and there's some potential other uh, groups out there as well, but but those are all places where you might be able to get some pro bono help doing doing risk assessment. Time, it's always a tough one, right? And how do you prioritize that? Leadership buy-in, hopefully the ROI can help with that. And again, I think just education of leadership as to don't, you know, you, you have to earn integrity by not, you know, yelling fire when, you know, there's not really serious things going on, okay? Uh, and questions are starting to come in. I really appreciate that. So let's just get through a couple last slides. So here's the, the list of resources from today's deck. Uh, the, that top one is something that we'll be keeping throughout, which is selected digital security and privacy resources. We're keeping kind of a curated one-page list of what we think are some of the best things we've seen, and that'll keep getting updated throughout. And on the ninja.rtt.nyc page, we will also uh, keep some, some useful resources there. It's actually a really great one that came out today um, from uh, ZDNet, a uh, guy named Zach something. That was a kind of uh, more for individuals, but very helpful. Uh, the information identification classification template that I, that we showed you, the risk analysis report template that we showed you, uh, access controls template, which I didn't show you, but it can also be a useful tool. Uh, a primer on backups, disaster recovery, and business continuity. Can I talk about the difference between backups and high availability, which is something that I, I find people often don't understand well. Uh, the NIST uh, publication, which uh, this risk assessment was kind of based on, and then some, some sample policies. And oh, I'm a little bit over. Next session, coming up in two weeks, February 7th, is basic network security. For those of you that have already registered for this or any future sessions, I owe you a huge apology. I'm going to have to uh, delete all the sessions, recreate them. It's a go to webinar thing. I didn't understand the way they set up their series. Uh, they're designed to basically be uh, different versions of the same webinar, and I did not understand that when I set it up. So I'm gonna have to delete all those and re-add them. The link here is is to the the correct one, and I'll, I'll be updating them on the way. We'll continue. If, if you most of you, I believe, found out about this via emails. So we won't send as many emails going forward for each webinar, but you will get emails. So you can sign up for any one of these. You don't need to attend all 10. You're certainly welcome to. We'd certainly love to have you at all 10 of them. Uh, but uh, you know, you can, you will, we'll send a nice little description for each upcoming uh, webinar series uh, or each upcoming webinar, who the guest is and things like that. And with that, we are at the Q&A. Oh, whoops, I'm sorry, I, uh, I didn't. Uh, I forgot that I was still showing the poll results. So let me, here's the resource list that I showed you. Right. So sorry about that, everybody. You missed a couple of slides. Here's the resource list that I ran through. Sorry that that was in front of you while I was talking through each resource. There it is now. And here's our next session, Basic Network Security with Ken Montenegro. And now we're at the Q&A. And with that, I'm going to open it up for questions. And if people do want to unmute, you can raise your hand. And if I can, I will attempt to unmute you. I believe I can. Yeah, I think I can do that. 
So for those of you who are in via the web uh, and have you know microphones and stuff like that, uh, I can unmute you if you if you want to raise your hand. And other than that, I'm going to just start answering the questions here. I will read them off and then I will ask them. Hang on a second. Okay, so uh, let's see. List out the, will I list out the pro bono company somewhere? Yes, I will. And I can, I'll just type those into the chat for everybody. Okay, so Taproot Plus is one. If you just Google these, I think you'll uh, um, be able to find them. Okay, um, Catchafire, which Catchafire does cost $200 a month or $2,000 a year for nonprofits, but they do have some different pro bono projects that include some risk assessments and cybersecurity related things. So that's another one. Uh, LinkedIn for nonprofits. And just using the LinkedIn network of your uh, nonprofit is uh, another, if you're a nonprofit organization, I know there's uh, a number of private sector organizations here. Um, and all these are for uh, nonprofit organizations. Okay, if you're a private sector organization, unfortunately these, these resources are not available to you. So I apologize for that. Um, but those are those are the three uh, big ones that, that I know of. Okay, and let's see. All right. Oh, sorry, everybody was seeing stuff about the quick poll. I did hide the poll, right? Everybody seeing the slides again now? I think we should be. Yep. Okay. All right. We will send the email. So here's a question: What is the best form? to protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability? I'm not sure that I understand that question well enough. What is the best form to protect confidentiality? Do you mean like Google Forms versus SurveyMonkey uh, versus something else? I, I, if that's the question, I actually am, am not sure off the top of my head what's the best form tool to use to protect confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Uh, if that question can be elaborated on or if you want to attempt to raise your hand and I'll see if uh anyone have their hand up here. Can you be unmuted? No? Okay. All right. So another question, a firewall, is it enough? Uh short answer is no. Uh just having a firewall for your organization is certainly not sufficient. Um, for all security <laughs> needs, right? And firewalls can vary a great degree depending on whether they're updated, how they're configured, uh, a number of things along those lines. So, so no, just having a firewall is certainly not enough. And uh, firewalls themselves can vary a lot in terms of their how well they work, how they're configured, whether they're updated, and firewalls definitely need to be updated in order to be. And uh, we will cover that uh, somewhat more extensively next week in the uh, basic network security where we will definitely dedicate some time to talking about firewalls. So hopefully that'll help people. Okay. I'll stick around for a little bit. If there's any other questions from anybody, again, you can raise your hand. You could let me know in the chat if you want me to unmute you so you can have a conversation. If anyone has anything to contribute or anything to share with the audience, I would also invite you to, uh, to request to be unmuted and I can uh, have you come on and you're welcome to to share something or share a share a story or something like that. These these little uh, extra time is going to be dedicated to people sharing information, you know, for as long as people want to stick around. Uh, but it looks like we are done with questions. And if that is the case, I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. So thank you very much, everybody, for attending today. Hopefully we will see a lot of you back in two weeks on February 7th. We'll, we'll send some emails around about that. And thank you all so very, very much. All right. Bye, everybody.